times like these. <clears throat> seated. All right, good evening again. To begin our program this afternoon, evening, we just like to have a word of prayer. We'd like to invite you to please stand as we open with prayer. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we just want to thank you again for this wonderful opportunity that we can be assembled here this evening. As our theme for this week is, What is Truth? And Father, you have told us in your holy words that if we, the, the truth is going to make us free, we desire that freedom. We pray and ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place today, the spirit of truth, not only to be present here, but to abide in each and every heart. Bless this meeting, bless the speaker, bless each listener, for we pray and ask these. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. Amen. Hmm. Uh, did we learn anything last night? Now, I believe that um, we've all gotten a card for the Q&A. Did everybody get a card? Uh, to write down their answers, or write down their answers to the question. Um, if you did not get one, I believe our ushers, yeah, I believe our ushers. Okay. Yeah, we'll just wait a little bit for those to get handed out. Now, who here likes tests and quizzes by show of hands? <laughs> now, what is the purpose of a quiz? Why, why are these things good? Okay, to test what we know. To test what we know. Now, does God give us uh, tests in our Christian experience? Yes, he does. Now, unfortunately, do we many times pass these tests and quizzes? Unfortunately, we tend to fail. We tend to fail. Now, do you think that we can keep failing and pass the big test? No. So do you think we need to start passing the little quizzes? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. All right, we'll wait a few more moments, and then we will get started. All right. Now, we're going to have five questions every night, five questions. So as we go over this... Um, you will hand um, and please write your name uh, on the um, on the little 
uh, excerpt uh, on your card. And we will go over the answers to these particular questions tomorrow evening. We'll go over the answers to these questions tomorrow evening. All right. Everybody ready? All right, question number one. What is Chris Jenner's biggest life regret? What is Chris Jenner's biggest life regret? Now, by show of hands, who was here last night? All right, so unfortunately, for some of those who were not here last night, you may not, unless you watch it on, on, on the Zoom, that you may not uh, be able to answer these questions. But the first question again is, what is Chris Jenner's biggest life regret? What is Chris Jenner's biggest life regret? All right, question number two. What is the only similarity between the houses, the two houses in Matthew chapter 7? What is the only similarity between the two houses in Matthew chapter 7? What is the only similarity? I'll say it again. What is the only similarity between the two houses in Matthew chapter 7? What is the only similarity? Everybody got it? All right, question number three. In the original Greek, what does the word trauma signify or what is its meaning? I'll say it again. In the original Greek, what does the word trauma signify or what is its meaning? One more time, just for the sake of clarification. In the original Greek, what does the word trauma signify or what is the meaning of the word trauma in the original Greek? All right. Question number four. What is the name of the tree that Elijah sat under when he was discouraged? I'll say it again. What is the name of the tree that Elijah sat under when he was discouraged? One more for the sake of clarity. What is the name of the tree that Elijah sat under when he was discouraged? And our last question, question number five. The restoration and uplifting of humanity begins where? Say it again. The restoration and uplifting of humanity begins where? All right, so that is our five. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out again. I am very excited as we are about to do another natural remedies demonstration. Who enjoyed the uh, castor oil demonstration yesterday? Anybody learn anything new? <laughs> well, there's a lot of things you can use it for. We, we were uh, finding out that you can use it for a lot. And so um, everybody has access to castor oil. And so we're going to look at a few more remedies today that we can use for from your kitchen. And these are simple remedies that we can use for the kitchen. So let's begin with the word of prayer and we will begin. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together. We pray that you will please uh, be with us, that you will give us your wisdom, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach us how to uh, best deal with the bodies. Lord, we're so thankful that you use the the little things in life to confound the wise. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll please teach us how to better be stewards of our bodies and, Lord, uh, to be a blessing to others in light of the times that we are in. We ask for uh, your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is my favorite. I am going to ask for three volunteers. <laughs> three volunteers. Okay. Come on up. We'll start with, yes, you can come up. So I'm going to have 
if you could come on this side. And I'll have, okay. So we'll have one here, one here, and then one here. So I can talk and the others can work <laughs> to help each other out. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm going to switch this one. So um, what I need you to do is grade the potato. And you are going to take the outer leaves of the cabbage and smash it with the bottom part with this knife on the top. So what we're going to do is look at the first page of the uh, pamphlet that was handed out. And I want um, everybody to look at the first top section that says uh, benefits of the onion. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. OK. So this is a beautiful gift from God. And I was, as I was doing this, I was thinking of all the, um, the object lessons we can learn, even in food. And an onion has a lot of anti-properties in, in it, antibacterial, antifungal, antivirus. Um, and it is very good with handling a lot of uh, diseases as well. And all of these that we're going to be doing today, they're, they're, they draw to itself. And I was just thinking about that principle in light of what you know, Christ does for us. He draws us to himself, but at the same time, uh, he also, like in this case, it draws the bad into itself. And so I, was, I also corresponded that to Christ, you know, taking our, our sins. And just in regards to sickness, in the same process, the onion does that. Now, um, with the onion, um, you can use this in many forms for the body, even for disinfecting and cleaning. Um, a lot of people use onion to get rid of odors. Um, if you cut an onion and you leave it out, it will, um, it will bring that bacteria from the air into itself. And that's why it, it, it would be best to use onions fresh. I don't know if any of you all go to a salad bar sometimes and you'll see chopped onions and stuff like that. Well, if it's been there for a while, guess what? It's pulling all the things that it's around it into itself. And it's best to store in glass jars as well because of that factor. You can use it to help to clean sickness in the air. If people are coughing and sneezing and things like that, you could put it on a plate in the house, even if you had a baby and they were sick, that's the best way that they can absorb the, um, the gases and the fumes from the onion that can help with the respiratory system as well. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to have my sister cut this onion for me. And uh, we're going to cut it in half. And we're not, I'm going to show you two different um, ways you can use the onion, but the first one we're just going to cut it in half with the skin on it. So you can cut it in half right in the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one side, and as you could tell, all these juices that are just gushing out of it, um, on... Um, on one aspect of it, we use it for sickness. Uh, we, you can use it raw. And um, you can use this by putting it in your sock. Has anybody ever tried putting onion in your sock? Mm -hmm. OK. You could actually even put it in a plastic bag if you want to save it from getting in your sock. But you put it on your foot. You will put it under so that the soles of the feet are touching it. You can chop it up into pieces if you want, put it in the bag as well, and do it that way. And normally, you could sleep overnight. Uh, in this process, sometimes it can induce a fever uh, in the sense that if you are starting to get sick, it can make you sweat out the fever throughout the night. It can move forward the process of healing. And so that's very good for uh, raw onion. Um, as well as um, you can also take this and you can put it to your nose and you can start sniffing it, the juice. You can actually put it like, to your nose and sniff the juice. If you have a hard time getting rid of the uh, phlegm and mucus, or you, you can't blow it out and you feel it stuck, you know, we would sometimes just sit there and sniff it for a while, and the juices going into the nasal pass, uh, passageway helps to uh, break up 
the mucus and you're able to release. So that is the ones we recently did, which is a blessing. Uh, the other one for the onion um, is to use it uh, cooked. So you would uh, cut it, oh, no, no, you would cut it in half just like this, and you will steam it. Um, you can steam it or you could bake it. If you bake it, you can just do it whole. And normally you could do it around like 450 for about roughly 15 minutes. And it will, it, will, it will be a bit softer, and you could tell that it, it's cooked. But normally, you could just steam it. Steam it. Um, don't, I wouldn't necessarily cook it in the water. I would do the steaming process uh, so you don't lose the nutrients from the onion. And then after, when it is steamed, you would be able to squeeze out some of the juices from the onion. Now, you could use this for ear infections. And what I would do is uh, take a, after you steam it, it's going to be hot, of course. But you would put it into, uh, you would squeeze it into the spoon, and then you can insert it into the ear. And though it will be hot, the process of it going into the spoon and cooling for a second, and then going into your ear will bring relief from the, the pain of the ear ache. And after, you would take uh, a cloth. If you had a cloth, normally like a cotton cloth, and just for demonstration purposes, you would wrap it up so you could have. It could be pretty thick because it's going to be very hot, and of course the moisture and the liquid is going to come through that cloth. And then you'll have yourself a, a, a ear application, and you would place it where the ear, which the affected ear, and you would put a plastic wrap over it also to keep the heat because the more you, the the because there's pain, there's constrict a constriction when there's cold. So there's cramp-like feelings when you have pain. So the heat and the warmth in that area will help to relieve that area. So you want to put uh, plastic on top, and then you would like to wrap it. Or you could use um, a beanie hat sometimes to keep it there. Or you can lay on the side if you want to. That's another way of doing it. And so uh, that's the benefits of using an onion. And so that is all for the onion. We are going to go to the, our next page, which is our poultices. And I'll, help, I'll, I'll let you help apply these. So you can stay if you want. Um, so what I'm going to <laughs> if you want, if you can sit down if you want to. Uh, so no. So we're going to start with the potato, and then I'll tell you how to do this. If you can just go like this on the cabbage with the back of it. Yes. So with the potato, the potato has a lot of good functions. And so what we do with the potato is we normally grade the potato first so that you can draw out the juices and you can use as much as you can. Normally I do it on top of the paper towel so that you can, um, you can just get the area that you want. And so depending on what area you have inflammation, which is what I use this normally for, how many, people, how many people do you all know who have inflamed ankles or inflamed uh, knees or um, edema? Uh, there was one person that we were working with. Unfortunately, um, he had a very, 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 very severe cancer. And um, when he came, uh, it was a blood cancer, but when he came out of the hospital, his, his, he was so skinny physically but around his feet and his ankles, they were literally like this big, like literally this big, all, all the way through to his foot. And, uh, but he was skinny. He was still, because of the cancer, it was uh, really affecting him. So we did this. We, we did a, um, a rotation between the potato and the cabbage. And normally I do one to the other. The potato is a very... Uh, nice feel. It gives nourishment to uh, that area as well. And so after you grate it, that should be good. I think this is good. Yeah, this is a good enough. And so normally it gets pretty wet. I normally use sometimes like two paper towels and then I'll have my I'll have it like this. And so can you all see that? So you have your potato poultice. And if you need to use more, sometimes depending on how swollen the area is, you may need to use more. So then in the process, what you can do is we'll do your arm, just for example. 
is for example purposes. So uh, she would place it, let's say it was, if it was on top, sometimes people have inflammation up here as well. You would just, yep, put her, yep, put her arm, you could turn it around. And then you would put the paper towel on. And then you'll take the saran wrap. Hopefully it'll cooperate today. Yes. You will smell like potatoes. And oh, it's coming out now. And also, uh, with the cabbage, it smells too. But um, so, so then we wrap it on. <laughs> and then you tear. A meat paste? Yeah, I was, I was going to share another. It's what I had. <laughs> So now you're wrapped up. As you can see, it's on like this. And normally, I would just put if they have a jacket or a shirt over it. And normally, they go to bed. You leave it on overnight. In the morning, you can tell it'll be ready to throw out. But um, within a week, with the, uh, with the brother we were working with, a week, his leg went from here to like th back to normal. And everybody who was there was, we were praising the Lord. because the benefits of what God has given us uh, through nature. So especially with dealing with inflammation, these things draw it into itself. And they're very good for um, sensitive areas as well, the potato, not the onion. You wouldn't use the onion in every place, but like let's say eyes, if you had problems with your eyes or in areas where they're sensitive, you can use the potato. And um, you can also take potato juice. Did you not, did you, has anybody ever had any indigestion or problems with your stomach if you boil the potato in water and just drink the water it will actually relieve the um uh, the stomach of even ulcers as well so you can use the potato uh, potato water or you can even juice the potato and uh, if you juice the potato same benefits but it helps with uh, relieving inflammation but you want to know where the inflammation is coming from right because we talked about ascertaining the cause yesterday and so then we can use these things to assist nature after we change those habits. So that one's done. And then we're going to come here to our cabbage. Um, I had him take a couple leaves, outer leaves of the cabbage. So you can still use the rest for food. And then you put, um, you lay it out depending on the area. Normally, sometimes the knee, you may need about this size. You see? And as you can see, he's been hitting it with the back of the knife. You can, I can, you can actually probably like use a rolling pin. You can use a fork, sometimes whatever you have. Sometimes when I'm in certain places, I don't have everything. So you can use the back of a, of a knife. You can hit it, you can pound it. And as you can see, can you see the juices here? So you'll see the juices coming up to the top part of the leaves. And so these are the juices that helps with the inflammation. And so you would put it around that uh, area. I was gonna say, who wants to? Are you gonna do it on your? Um, okay. So you would just put it on, and then you would wrap it with the saran wrap on top. Same concept. Leave it on overnight, and um, normally you should see uh, the inflammation uh, dwell down drastically. These are one of the uh, fastest ways that I've seen that have worked um, the best, and is very easy. And you have it at home. You use it. Cabbage, cabbage juice, same thing. If you drink cabbage juice, it can help relieve stomach ulcers as well. So these are very good remedies that we can use if we have ailments. But we always want to remember first that we want to ascertain the cause and that prevention is better than cure. So these are the remedies that God has given us today. And you can share it with someone, uh, share it with a neighbor. Um, you have these cards. You can make copies, give it to the, to someone next door, and you can actually show them, look at what God has given us through, through nature to help deal with this. I mean, it really blows people's mind. They're like, oh, I don't have to take um, uh, um, aspirin or all these different, you know, drugs to deal with the pain of the inflammation. So these are what God has given us. So let's give a thank offering to the Lord. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these blessings, Lord. I thank you for um, our participants. I pray, Lord, that you will bless each and every one of us um, in our journeys to health. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to uh, be stewards of your body, that we may keep the laws of health. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Uh, for this evening, we're actually going to uh, do something we said we were going to do tomorrow, and so we're actually going to go over the answers to the quiz. Uh, we had a, um, a meeting of the minds, and we have decided that this is the best option. All right, so does everybody have their quiz cards for those who took the quiz? Yes. Now, by show of hands, who thinks they got 100? Now, I have been told that the only way to actually even qualify for a prize is that you actually have to get a full 100%. I'm sorry for those of us who might have gotten just a, an, an 80. All right. So question number one, it was, what is Kris Jenner's biggest life regret? Does anybody know the answer to that? Yes. Divorce, okay, that's, separation, separation. okay, that's good, okay, yes. Yes, so it was committing adultery on her late, on her first husband. Yes, now who, who got that? My show of hands. All right, now what was last night's message? What was the title of last night's message? Keeping up with the Kardashians, all right, question number two. What is the only similarity between the houses in Matthew chapter 7? Yes. Not okay, good answer. Okay. Okay, so both went through storms. Did anybody get that? Everybody got that? Okay. <laughs> All right, question number three. It's a little hard. In the original Greek, what does the word trauma signify, or what is its meaning? Yes. Yes, we can take hands. Yeah. Anybody know? Yes. Yes, it means wound. It means wound. All right. Question number four. What is the name of the tree that Elijah sat under when he was discouraged? Okay, yes. The juniper tree, all right. And what book of the Bible was that in? Okay. Okay, First Kings. Yes, First Kings 19, yes. All right, question number five. The restoration and uplifting of humanity begins where? In the home. Now, who got 100? All right, so for those of us who got 100, we can give our, if you can write your name on it, and signifying that you got 100, you can put it there, and now you qualify for a prize. All right, so we can try again tomorrow evening, and by God's grace, we can seek to get all the answers correct. All right, now, does anybody know what is the subject matter for this evening? Anybody know? Yes, fat, sick, and what? And very, and very, very dead. Now, do you think that this is a serious subject that we're about to go through? Yes. Now, every subject that we're going to talk about this week is a very serious subject. Now, was the home a very serious sub subject? Yes. yes, it was. Now, again, we just found out that the restoration and uplifting of, our, of, our, of society, that it begins in the home. Now, we're actually going to find out that it's as a result of a neglect of this subject that we're going to study tonight is one of the great reasons why so many persons, even many of us as professed Christians, why we struggle in our religious life. In the light of that, I'm just going to kneel and have a word of prayer, and we will get started. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us again this evening to be able to study your word and spirit and the truth. Father, I pray that you would please be with my mind and my heart. I pray that you bring back to my remembrance everything that you have impressed upon my conscience. Be with my brothers and sisters here. We plead for your Holy Spirit, dear Heavenly Father. Without his ministration, no amount of fervency, the Lord is going to do what you desire to have done. I pray they be with the online audience, those who are watching. I just pray, dear Lord, that they may not lose any of the blessing. And I just pray that you would keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now, does everybody have their Bibles? Does everybody have their Bibles? 
Now, why is it important to have your Bible? Why is it important to have your Bible? Yes, it's the Word of God. Now, did we come here necessarily to hear the words of a human being? No, we didn't. We came to hear the Word of the Lord. Because at the end of the day, can the Word of a human being grant us and give us salvation? Now, whose Word gives us salvation? God. We're also going to find out tonight that God's Word actually brings healing physical healing and restoration now let's open up our Bibles let's open up our Bibles let's open up our Bibles to the book of first Corinthians let's open up our Bibles to the book of first Corinthians and we're gonna to turn to chapter 6 we're gonna open up to first Corinthians and we're going to turn to chapter 6 as we go to our screen first Corinthians chapter 6 as we go to our screen all right, fat, sick, and very dead. Fat, sick, and very dead. Now, can everybody see this picture? Does this dear woman look like a beacon of health? Does she look like she is thriving in her physical form? Now, you know, there is a movement today called uh, 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 fat positivity. Has anybody ever heard of this, this movement? Unfortunately, as a result of the society that we live in, now, now this is not a means to arbitrarily uh, degrade any person that may look like this dear woman here, but is it a healthy thing to be in this condition? But there is a movement today that says that we should actually celebrate persons who are morbidly obese, that we should validate them in their level of unhealthiness. Now, is validating someone in obesity, is this good for them? No. Now, does obesity lead to long life and longevity? No, no it doesn't. Now, some person may say, well, I, I'm a beacon of health because I don't look like this. Now, just because a person is skinny, does this mean that they're in health? No, no it doesn't. And we're actually going to find out that God has a very serious vested interest on how we take care of our bodies how we take care of our bodies. Fat, sick, and very dead. Now this is taken from The Guardian. This says, Americans are sicker and dying younger. I wonder why. It says, than people in other wealthy nations. This says, America may be one of the richest countries in the world, but its people are less healthy and more likely to die early from disease or accidents than those in other affluent countries. Now, before we even uh, finish going through this, what do you think are some of the reasons that are contributing to why we as Americans are so morbidly unhealthy? Lack of exercise. Lack of exercise. What else? Food, food choices, no temperance. Do all of these things contribute to not having proper health? Yes, we're about to say something. Yes, pass down ignorance from generation to generation. All of these things contribute to this reality. Now, do you think that not taking care of our bodies has an effect on us spiritually? Yeah. It does directly. It does directly. All right, it says, even the best off Americans, those who have health insurance, a college education, a high income, are sicker than their peers in comparable countries. We're going we're gonna to jump past this. This says, even taking out drunk driving, Americans lose more years of life to alcohol and other drugs than people in other affluent nations. All right, this says, death by diet, the race to transform the world's bad food habits. Now, do you think that the whole world is starting to adopt the unhealthy practices here in America? You know, as we're going to find out, you know, um, there was a, a, a Chinese sister that we came in contact with a number of years ago, and uh, she was at an uh, institution that teaches health and wellness, and she was mentioning that when she was growing up in China, KFC was actually a delicacy. So when she got straight A's on her report card, her family would take her and her siblings out to KFC, and they would indulge in the fancy. Now, is KFC a delicacy? No, it is not. It says, death by diet, the race to transform the world's bad food habits. This says, half a century ago, farmers grew rice, sesame, and pulses on the land 
around Mayant Soy's village in Myanmar. Now only paddy fields remain. He said many people are suffering from cancer, hardening of the arteries, and other ailments likely caused by eating low-quality oil, sugary drinks, salty snacks, and instant noodles. Now are instant noodles and all of these things that this is describing, is this good for the health? Now let's think about this. Actually, let's turn to, we're already in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to read 1 Corinthians uh, 6. 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to read in verse 19. We're going to see why understanding this is so critically important. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. It says, what? This is a question by the Apostle Paul. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the what? Of the Holy Ghost. Now, who is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is God. This says, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your what? Ye are not your own. Why are you not your own? Notice what the Bible goes on to say in verse 20. For ye are bought with a what? So God is saying is that I bought you. Now, how did God buy us? So Jesus dying on the cross, he did what for us? He bought us. Now, let's think about this intellectually. If you bought, say, a new cell phone that cost $1,500 from the store, and this phone was not working properly, and you just bought it, would you be upset in how this cell phone is not working? Now, as God looks at us, he bought us, and when we decide to do whatever we want with our bodies, it makes him grieved because he bought us to act and function a certain way. Does that make sense? And when we act outside of that paradigm, it brings him grief and consternation. Does that make sense? All right. So back to the screen, it says, what is happening in Thayar Su is just a microcosm of one of the world's biggest problems. Deadly diets which have now overtaken smoking as the world's biggest what? Now, let's turn in our Bibles. We read this text yesterday, but for the sake of context, as we talk about this, let's turn to Ephesians. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read this text again. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read in verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read in verse 12. When you have it, you can say amen. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against what? Powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in what type of places? In high places. So in light of all of this bad diet and poor health and all of this, who is directly behind this state of things? Satan. Satan. Now, this, we, we need to understand this. Why do you think Satan has a vested interest in ensuring that we don't take care of our bodies? Okay, it distorts the image of God. It messes, it messes with the mind and all of these things. Now, how does God communicate with us? Yes, through the mind, which is housed in the brain. Now, how does the brain receive nutriment or nutrients? By the food that we eat. So if we degrade our body with the things that we eat, lack of exercise, watching uh, too much television and all these things, is it going to affect our mind's ability to be able to communicate with God? Yes. It can even be so that you could even have Elijah, Moses, Jeremiah, John the Baptist preaching to you, but if your body is not in a proper condition, that means that your mind is not in a proper condition. Now, let's think about this. Was everyone converted that listened to the preaching of Jesus? Was everyone converted that listened to the preaching of Jeremiah? Was everyone converted that listened to the preaching of all of the patriarchs and prophets? I wonder if how they were taking care of their bodies had anything to do with that. I wonder. It's a good question. All right, now back to the screen. It says, it says, we've already reached the tipping point. We could have successful trade policies which enable food to be passed between countries in a sensible way. Now, this is a particular Canadian physician that was very prominent around the turn of the 20th century. 
Now, notice what this man uh, documented in a book that he wrote called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Notice, the modern man is declining in physical fitness. Now, is this true? Yes, it is. You know, Darwinian evolution proposes to us that man is actually ascending and getting better. But the Bible describes that man is actually deteriorating. The Bible describes that when man was first created, that this is when we were at our apex. But as a result of sin, we have been deteriorating. This says, has been emphasized by many eminent sociologists that the rate of degeneration is progressively accelerating, constitutes a great cause for a, a great cause, a cause for great alarm particularly since this is taking place in spite of the advance, notice, of modern, modern science. You know, the Bible says science falsely so-called. At the bottom, it says many primitive races have ha made habitual use of certain preventative measures in meeting crucial life's problems. So in light of this, do you think that we need to be educated on how to take care of our bodies? Yes, we do. Does the Bible have anything to say about how to take care of the somatic structure? Yes, it does. Let's notice this. Now, this is an article from the New York Times. This is a very fascinating article. This is from 1971. Some of us weren't even born yet. This says why they live to be 100 or even older in Abaskia. Has anybody ever heard of this place? Now let's do some investigation. Notice, not long ago in the village of Tarnish in the Soviet Republic, so this is during the time of the Soviet Union, of Abaskia, I raise my glass of wine to toast, this is the reporter, I raise my glass of wine to toast a man who looked no more than 70 years old. May you live as long as Moses, who was 120, I said, he was not pleased because he was 119. I wonder how this man was living so long. You know, they even talk about and document that some of these people were living even to 140. I wonder what their habits of life were like. For centuries, the Abaskians and other Caucasian peasants have been mentioned in the chronicles of travelers amazed at their longevity and good health. Even now on occasion, newspaper reports in the United States and elsewhere will tell of these people who claims to be 120 and sometimes 130. Now, about how long was man living in the very beginning of time, right after sin, entered into the human experience? Let's turn it our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Now, was the Bible exaggerating the ages of these men? No, they weren't. You see, because when you understand the condition of the world at that time, the vital force that was put into humanity, it makes perfect sense why humanity was living this long. The question is, why is our lifespan so short in comparison to them? Is this a good question? It's a very good question. Genesis, all right, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Actually, for the sake of context, we'll just turn to Genesis chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Now, one of the portions of the Bible that many of us, even as Christians, lament to have to go through are the genealogies. Are the genealogies important? Yes. They're vitally important. Is every part of the Bible important? Yes. yes. What we have to do, we have to pray that God will give us a love for these things. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name what? So the Bible is saying that Adam and Eve together were both called Adam, even Eve. Very interesting. In the day that they were created. <laughs> well, I won't go there. All right, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his want. Now, now this is very sad. Adam was made in the image of God, but his first son was made in whose image? In Adam's image. That's very sad. It says, and called his name what? 
And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he did what? Is 930 years a very long time? Could you imagine living almost a thousand years? Imagine what you could accomplish if you had 900 years to live on this planet. Now, who here plays the piano? I know that our dear brother plays the piano, some of us. Imagine if you had almost a thousand years to perfect piano playing. What type of pianist could you possibly be? Now, when we get to heaven, how much time are we going to have? We're going to have eternity. Is that a lot of time to cultivate the gifts and talents that God has given to us? Again, so back to the point, the question is, how has man's life shrunk so much? And these, their people that we saw here from this caucus region, they are an evidence of what happens when you live in congruence with God's plan. We don't have time to go through the idiosyncrasies of this article, but I would highly encourage you to go through it. Very, very interesting. All right, skip past this. Now, this is taken from, again, a book called The Ministry of Healing, a very powerful treaty on the laws of health written around the turn of the 20th century. Notice what this says. Education in health principles was never more needed than now. Is that true? Yes, it is. Notwithstanding the wonderful progress in so many lines relating to the comforts and conveniences of life, even to sanitary matters and to the treatment of disease, the decline in physical vigor and power of endurance is alarming, just like the Canadian dentist said. It demands the attention of all who have at heart the well-being of their fellow men. Our artificial civilization, do we live in an artificial civilization? Has anybody ever heard of the metaverse? Anybody ever heard of the metaverse? This is a new phenomenon being brought forth by Mark Zuckerberg and his associates where humanity is being encouraged to live a life that is completely artificial. Is this how God intended things to be on this planet? No, it's not. It says, is encouraging evils destructive of sound principles, custom and fashion are at war with what? You see, God wants us to live more in harmony with nature. More in harmony with nature. When man was first created, was he put in a penthouse in downtown Manhattan? Was he put in a penthouse in Dubai? Is that where man was put when he was first created? Where was he put? He was put in a, in a garden. He was put in a garden. All right. Skip past this. All right, does everybody see this? Yeah. This is the body. Let's turn it our bombers to the book of Psalms. Let's turn it our bombers to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 139. This may be a text that, be, that is familiar to some of us. Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139. We're going to start in verse 12. Psalms chapter 139, starting in verse 12. When you have it, you can say Amen. It says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to what? They're both alike to thee. Verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's what? In my mother's womb. Verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right what? 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. So the Bible is clearly here describing that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In light of that, do you think that we need to learn how to take care of this body? Do you think that we need to learn the laws that pertain to the regulation of our system? Yes. One of the very greatest things that we can even do for our little children is to teach them anatomy and physiology. One of the greatest things we can do for our children. All right, we're going to skip past this. Now, again, in light of this, where should we go to learn how to take care of our body? 
the Bible. Now, what does secular science say? Where should we go in order to learn about our body according to the world? Yes, academia. But does academia know the idiosyncrasies of the body in its greatest depth? You know, even modern science cannot understand nor explain the mystery of life. Do you know that when somebody dies and a defibrillator comes or they're, you know, in that, that space of about to die possibly, the heart stops or something to that effect, and the paramedics come and bring the defibrillator, is it the defibrillator that brings the person back to life and revives them? No, it's not. It doesn't matter how much electrical force you pump into that body. If God does not permit the breath of life to enter back into them, are they going to come back to life? No, they're not. All right. Now, notice what this says. This is from Secular Science. This is from the Daily Mail. Now, is the Daily Mail a religious outlet? No, it's not. This is from a, this is a British publication. Was the Bible right about the origins of life? Was it right? Yes, yes it was. Scientists believe that we may have had our beginnings in clay. Is that what the Bible says? It brings up that point, yes. You see, the only thing true science is, is man's investigation of the laws of nature that God has made. Anything outside of that reality is science falsely so-called. All right, we're going to skip past this. We read this just for the sake of context. Going past this. Now, as it pertains to our physical bodies, it is impossible for us to go over everything in this one little session on how to properly take care of our body. But we're going to go over two particular points of health that we need to understand. Now, if we're going to be healthy, what is one of the number one things we need to understand? It starts with an N. Nutrition. Now, is nutrition important to our health? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And when you have it, you can say amen. amen. When you have it, you can say a amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Notice what the Bible says. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of yourself and your appetites and passions. Is that what the Bible says? It says, do all to the glory of God. So we need to understand what are those things that we are supposed to eat and drink that give glory to God. This also insinuates that there are things that we can eat and drink that do not give God glory. Does that make sense? So does that mean that as Christians, as believers, that we are just permitted to eat whatever we want? No, we're not. Because our body is the temple of, our body is the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Ghost. All right, back to the screen. All right, this is a symbol of nutrition, a symbol of nutrition. Does this look like some healthy food? Yes, yes it does. does. Does anything here look like it came from McDonald's? What about Popeyes? No. All right. I'm not trying to land blast Popeyes, but you get the point. All right, this is a symbol of nutrition. This is the body. We see, we saw that from uh, Psalm chapter 139. Again, from that uh, tree, the ministry of healing. Our bodies are built up from the food that we want. Now, notice this principle of physiology. Notice. There is a constant breaking down of the tissues of the body Every movement of every organ involves waste, and this waste is repaired from our what? You know, this is just a point of interest. When we get to heaven, are our bodies going to give off waste? <laughs> That's just food for thought. Each organ of the body requires its share of nutrition. The brain must be supplied with its portion. The bones, muscles, and nerves demand theirs. It is a wonderful process that transforms the food into blood and uses this blood to build up the varied parts of the body. This is an amazing process that takes place in our system. Amazing. All right, this is taken from CNN Health. This is very interesting. Notice, 
Poor diets threaten U.S. national security. CNN Health is telling us that as Americans, our diet and health is so poor that it's actually a national security issue. Equated with that of, of, of foreign and domestic terrorism. America's poor diet isn't just bad for us, it's now considered a threat to national security. Diet-related illness are a uh, growing burden on the United States economy. Now, does anybody know roughly how much money is being spent on health care every year in the United States? You think it's about $100 million? What about 200? What about $900 million? It's billions, really. Is it just a billion dollars? Yes, tens of billions of dollars. It says about 46% of adults in the country have an overall poor quality diet. And this number goes up to 56% for children. Now again, who is behind all of this poor diet reality? Satan. Satan. Across the globe, our diets are making us sicker. We saw some of this already. Now what is this? What is this dear woman eating? Is this a, a, a healthy, organic meal fresh from the garden that she's eating? Has anybody ever watched a documentary called Super Size Me by a show of hands? Anybody ever watched that documentary? As a result of that documentary, this is actually why McDonald's, one of the reasons why they no longer have the Super Size menu is as a result of that documentary. That documentary showed that if you wholly subsist on eating McDonald's, it will literally destroy your health from the top down. Do you think, now this, again, this is not to land blast McDonald's and what they're doing, but genuinely speaking, God bless their hearts, is McDonald's concerned with the health and wellness of its customers? No, it is not, unfortunately. And, and this is just food for thought. It's very interesting to note that Bill Gates is actually the main distributor of most of the produce that fast food restaurants actually use in their restaurants. That's just food for thought. This says 20 fast food chains that rake, rake in the most money. Now this is says annually McDonald's makes about $35 billion. Is that a lot of money? That is a lot of money. Starbucks, known for all of its coffee. I always wondered why the picture of that woman was its logo. I always wondered that. Subway, 11 billion, Burger King, 9 billion, and so on and so forth. The global uh, siren call of fast food. Global siren call of fast food. Now notice this. The enthusiasm for, this is the middle paragraph, the enthusiasm for fast food is unbridled. I was in Nigeria. Now, is Nigeria one of the states in the United States? Where's Nigeria? It's halfway across the world. I was in Nigeria's capital preparing to head north to report on the war against the Islamist uh, militant group Boko Haram when I discovered a weekend hotspot, Domino's Pizza. So in the middle of the war with Boko Haram, they can go and get Domino's Pizza. This is insanity. Fast food arrived in Ghana in recent years, and some people I talk with inside KFC and other restaurants. All right. Now, what does this word say? Learn. learn. Do you think that we need to learn? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Let's turn to Hosea. That's after Daniel. Hosea. Hosea. Hosea chapter 4, when you have it, you can say amen. amen. All right, this is a familiar text to some of us, Hosea chapter 4, and we're going to read in verse 6. Notice what the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 in verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. knowledge. So is knowledge important? Do we need intellectual understanding and development? Yes, we do. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, so it's not that just the lack of the knowledge, but the rejection of the knowledge that you could have. 
It says, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Notice this last part. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy what? So our unwillingness to educate ourselves in regards to the laws of our body, it's directly going to affect our children. Is that serious? It's very serious. All right. Now, does anybody know what this is? What is that man doing with his child? This is our last point. Anybody know what this is? This dear man, he is nurturing. nurturing, okay. What are they doing? They're sleeping. Do you think that sleeping is intrinsically important to our health? Yes, yes it is. It's intrinsically important to our health. You know what? Let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. We're going to turn to chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Does the Bible have anything to say about going to sleep and its importance? Yes, it does. There's a lot to say about the importance of sleep and its importance. All right, Proverbs chapter 3. All right, Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Three. Notice what the Bible says. Then shalt thou walk in thy way, what? Safely. And thy foot shall not, what? And thy foot shall not stumble. It says, when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be, what? Sweet. Is, there, is, is having sweet sleep... Very good and refreshing. Yes. yes, it is. Notice what it goes on to say. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it what? Do you think that as a result of many persons dealing with anxiety, that that tends to affect our sleep? Yes, yes it does. But God says, be not afraid of sudden fear. Also as well, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to, uh, we're actually still in Proverbs. Let's turn to, we're still in Proverbs chapter 3. Let's turn to Proverbs, uh, let's actually, let's turn to Psalms. There's so many texts. Let's turn to Psalms. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 4. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 4. You know, one of the things that it's very important for us to understand, does anybody know what is the greatest medical book that has ever been given to humanity? Anybody know? The Bible. Is the Bible merely nice devotional reading? Now, is it the Bible? Is the Bible great devotional reading? Yes. But is it much more than that? Yes. If you want to learn about the mysteries of the universe, where should you go? The Bible. the Bible. If you want to learn about the future and what's going to happen, where should you go? If you want to want to learn about the most ancient history, where should you go? If you want to learn about the laws of health, where should you go? The Bible. Should you be afraid to go to the Bible? Now, you know, many times, I know that a lot of times when, uh, when we're talking with maybe our friends who are not uh, believers, sometimes we feel uh, maybe a little intimidated to bring up the Bible in conversation. You know, it's amazing. One of the things, one of the testimonies that was always said of Jesus was that he spoke with, as one having authority and not as the scribes. Anytime Jesus presented the Bible, he always presented it as a book as having authority unquestionable authority. So when we are interacting with others, when we present the Bible, we should present it as if it has unquestioned authority. Because does it have unquestioned authority? Because who's its author? God. All right. All right. Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4. Everybody have it? Psalm chapter 4. We're going to read in verse 8. Notice what the Bible says. I will both lay me down in what? In peace. So again, notice the parallel. We saw this in the book of Proverbs. Is being at peace before you go to sleep necessary in order to have good sleep? Yes. I will lay both, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, 
only makest me dwell in what? In safety. We saw yesterday, even with Kendall Jenner, that she is racked with anxiety and depression. Do you think that she has good sleep? No, she doesn't. All right. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 127. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 127. Psalm chapter 127. Now, this is another principle of having good sleep. So we see it as it pertains to having peace before we rest. We shouldn't be racked with anxiety. Jesus promises us the peace that surpasseth all understanding. But we're about to read another principle that pertains to having good sleep. Psalm chapter 127, starting in verse 1. It says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in what? Vain. Notice verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up what? Vain. I'll read it again. It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. So according to the Bible, not merely secular science, should we be staying up late and waking up early? No, we shouldn't. Now, especially in this day and age, do you think that the vast majority of us, especially as Americans and living in Western society, that we're going to bed at very early times? No, no we're not. Do you know, I remember, uh, has anybody ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Elon Musk? Anybody ever heard of this gentleman? Yes, he owns Tesla, SpaceX, many, uh, many different things. Unfortunately, this man is now on seemingly, seemingly like a rampage just getting all of these different women pregnant. Now, one of his baby mamas is a woman by the name of Grimes. God bless her heart. This dear woman is a recording artist, and she mentioned that she usually goes to bed around 6 a.m. She usually goes to bed around 6 a.m. and wakes up around 12 noon or 1 p.m. Do you think that this is healthy for the body? But do you think that it's only Grimes that is practicing those things? Do you think that many of us as Americans, especially young people, are practicing these things? Yes. Now notice this. Ten reasons to get more Sleep. Do you think that being chronically sleep deprived can even affect our spiritual life? Yes. Yes, it can. Many times when we come to church and God is trying to communicate to us through the sermon, do many times we find ourselves falling asleep? Does everybody remember in the book of Acts when the apostle Paul was preaching? What happened to that young man that was sitting in the window? He fell asleep, and what happened? He just got back up. He died. He literally had to be wake, awoken from his death. Ten reasons to get more sleep. It says it helps to maintain or lose weight. Now, who here wants to maintain a good weight or lose weight? According to this, we need to make sure that we get proper sleep. Numerous studies have associated short sleep defined as sleeping fewer than seven hours. In fact, 2020 analysis find that adults who slept fewer than seven hours per night had a whopping 41% increased risk of developing obesity. Is that a huge percentage? That's a very huge percentage. Meanwhile, sleeping longer didn't increase the risk. It says the effect of sleep on weight gain is believed to be affected by numerous factors, including hormones and motivation to exercise. This is supported by various studies, so on and so forth. Next, it improves concentration and what? So when you are chronically sleep deprived, is this going to affect your brain's ability to function adequately? Yes. This is also another reason is it good to drive behind the wheel of a car when you are chronically sleep deprived? No, it's not. You know, they've even equated driving a car while you're chronically uh, tired to being a drunk driver. Is that serious? That's very serious. I don't play those games. If I'm getting tired, I will pull to the side of the road and go to sleep. 
Because the thing, this, this, this is the reality. If you get in a car accident and die, can you do it over again? No, you can't. Sleep is important for various aspects of brain function. Cognition, concentration, productivity, and performance are all negatively affected by sleep deprivation. A specific study on overworked physicians provides a good example. Notice these statistics. It found that doctors with moderate, high, and very high sleep-related impairment were 54, 96, and 97 more percent more likely to report clinically significant medical errors. I wonder if chronic sleep deprivation is one of the reasons why people die in hospitals. On a similar note, getting enough sleep can improve academic performance in children. And it not can, it does. All right. It strengthens your heart. Do you think that being sleep deprived affects your physical heart? You know, we actually have a dear friend who died not too long ago who, who chronically, as a result of a myriad of different reasons, was chronically sleep deprived. He had a very hard time getting enough sleep night after night. And sadly, as a result of those things, he had a heart attack. He had a heart attack. It says low sleep quality and duration may increase your, re your risk of developing heart disease. One analysis of 19 studies found that sleeping fewer than seven hours per day resulted in 13% increased risk of death from heart disease. What's more, uh, short sleep appears to increase the risk of high blood pressure especially in those with obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the question is, does God have a solution to all of these sleep issues? Yes, yes he does. Yes, he does. All right, poor sleep linked to depression. I wonder if one of the reasons why depression is such an issue in today's society is because so many of us are chronically sleep deprived. We're coming to a close. Coming to a close. Anybody know what this is? This is a practice that many of us tend to be guilty of. Right before sleep, we want to catch the latest sermon, right? Because we're not watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. We're not watching all these entertainments in the world. We're trying to keep up with the, with the, with the latest a nice sacred gospel song that we heard on the radio. Is that what we're doing? Is, is that what we're doing right before we go to bed? Do you think that these practices are good for our health? No, they're not. They're really, really not. This is taken from Cleveland Clinic. Why you should ditch your phone before bed. Does using your phone affect your sleep? Yes, using your phone too much close to bedtime can affect your sleep. What may seem like a harmless habit and this is many times what sin does, makes it seem harmless. Jumping into bed and opening up your phone can actually have a big impact on your overall health. Phone screens and sleep have a tricky relationship. The blue light from your phone is an artificial color that mimics daylight. Notice, this can be great during the day as it can make you feel more alert but it's just the opposite of what you need at night when you are winding down and ready to hit the hay. You see, as this is about to talk about, as the day the sun starts to go down, our body starts to shut down. But as we stick the cell phones in our face, it is literally deceiving our bodies into believing that the sun is now coming up and it's messing with the function of our sleep. Does that make sense? This says, studies have shown that the blue light uh, emitted by your smartphone is bad for your vision. Exposure to blue light can affect your internal body clock and throw off your circadian rhythm. This rhythm is in tune with light and dark. Now, which light and dark? Is that the street light outside? What light and dark is that? Day and night. Who created day and night? Do you think that God knew what he was doing? when he made our circadian rhythm correspond with day and night. Yeah. Yes, he did. This rhythm is in tune. It says, it's why you feel more tired at night when the sun starts to set 
and why you feel more energized in the morning when it's light. Research has found a correlation between suppressed levels of melatonin and exposure to blue light. So in light of this, do you think that we need to pray and ask God to help us so that we can practice proper habits as it pertains to sleep? You know, because even tonight, as we've heard these things, as we get back home, Satan is going to tempt us, pick up that phone. I know what you heard, you know, at the church and the sermon and all those things, but you need to check your email before you go to bed. Then that email turns into YouTube, then YouTube turns into Facebook, then Facebook turns into Instagram. And before you know it, you spent a whole hour and a half on the cell phone when you meant to go to bed time before. Do you think that this is actually a level of bondage? It is. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray that God will help us because any practice that destroys the body is an effort of Satan to gain control of our mind. Now, in light of that, who wants to have victory over these bad practices? Who wants to say that by God's grace, I want to take care of the body that God has given to me? And in light of that, I believe that we all have our appeal cards. We all have our appeal cards. If we can hand those out. As our appeal cards are handed out. Has it been made clear tonight that God has a plan for us as to how to take care of the bodies that he's given to us? Yes. Amen. As we hand out our appeal cards. As we hand out our appeal cards. Uh, can I get one up here as well? All right, thank you very much. As we have our appeal cards. All right, question number one. Question number one. It says, I agree with tonight's message and want to learn more. If that applies to you, you can check that. Who here wants to learn more about the laws of health? Amen. Question number two, I accept Christ as my personal savior from sin. Now, can we properly take care of our bodies without the help of Christ, without the help of the Holy Spirit? No, we cannot do it. All right, question number three. I would like personal Bible studies. If you are desiring to know more in regards to God's word and you want that, I just encourage you to check that. Uh, question number four. I would like to speak with the pastor personally. If there's anything that you want to specifically refer to, to talk about, we can spend some time going over some things. And question number five, it says, I need special prayer regarding sin in my life, and especially as it pertains to this specific subject. If you know that there are sins that you are practicing that are directly affecting your body, there's things that you know you shouldn't be eating that you know are helping to kill your body and you want special prayer in regards to that, I just encourage you to check that box. I just encourage you to check that box. In the light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the words of inspiration that you have communicated to us tonight. Lord, I just pray that you would please forgive us from the minister on down of our sins, that you would cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Father, we know as we're told in the book of James that he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And if, Father, you don't share these principles with us because you are trying to condemn us, it's because you're trying to help us, to save us, to improve our quality of life. I just pray that you be with all my brothers and sisters here gathered, especially those of us who know that we are dealing with serious satanic strongholds. Satan has us in bondage to our appetite. Satan has us in bondage to, to, to wrong habits of life. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us. I plead the blood of Christ over each and every one of us. Give us victory. Holy Father, we pray. I pray that you be with all of our uh, friends and family, and I pray that we can share these principles. There are so many people that are suffering with disease in the body who would not be suffering with it if they knew these simple, simple principles. 
And I just pray that you would please keep us to the center until we come out tomorrow night, Lord willing, in Jesus' name, amen.